He's a famous chief in North America. So the, the, uh, the captain decided to have a boxing match with a white man and my father. And my father beat the top. So this is me. This is about two years ago. I went and visited my father's dad. I, I visit this area often. And my daughter says, why is there a statue in Niagara Falls? Have you guys seen that statue before? Have you seen my father's statue? Anyone? That's in Niagara Falls, New York. And it's been there for a while. And why is it? And I'd like to explain why there's a st the statue there. So I was born hearing, and I became deaf at 18 months old. My father was like, "Ooh, I don't know what to do. Where, where do I send my child for school?" So they said, "There's a good school in Rochester. So Rochester School for the Deaf." So at three years old, you know, I was thinking like. Uh, so from age 18 months to three years old, like I was going to be there. And at that point, I was really fascinated with being deaf. I really didn't care about my Indian identity at that point because, you know, everyone, my father was hearing and it was hard to communicate with my father. And so my mom, I was able to communicate with her and I understood her because she enunciated with her lips, but my father, I just couldn't understand him. We didn't really talk. So, and he didn't know how to talk to me either. So as I grew up, I really immersed myself in the deaf world. And I noticed that my father, you know, that a lot of people talked about him. He was a famous chief. And a lot of people came to him because of it. And I didn't really understand why people would come and visit him. I really had no idea. So at that point, you know, I was going back and forth to the deaf school, and when my father passed away, I was not upset really. I didn't really cry. I didn't really have that bond because I didn't know him. You know, I was always gone a lot because I was between home and the deaf school. So, you know, we were very poor. We had no money but we had always had plenty of food, lots of vegetables. We had beef and, and pig and, and everything like that. But I had 10 brothers and sisters at that point. So my father had, when he was gone, we would come back together at Thanksgiving and my dad would be talking, my father would be talking and everyone would be listening to him. But I was there, I had no one to explain to me what was going on, so I just eat my food and I was like, ooh, I would like, I just want to go back to school because I'm back in my deaf world. And it was really just upsetting to me because I never really had that connection with my family. So uh, we had lots of vegetables and we worked on the farm. We had beans and peas and everything. So we had all the vegetables we wanted. So my brothers would butcher or slaughter the animals and my sister worked picking vegetables. So when my father passed away, I was like, eh, I, I really didn't have a connection, so it was, didn't really bother me. And when my father was buried, I'll explain about what that is. Um, he was buried in his headdress and wrapped in cloth, and he had his, his uh, customary clothes on. And everyone was crying and everyone was upset, but I was like, eh, he's just buried, he's just there. So. When I started working, I was in my deaf world, and when I was finally ready to retire at 55, I started to think, yeah, I've been a part of my deaf community, but I really should learn about my, my Indian or Native American heritage. So I started to visit my sisters and drive to visit them. You know, I was like, can you tell me why dad was so famous? 
And my father, like there's so many pictures and everything. And, you know, so we, I didn't understand why, because we really had no communication when I was young, younger growing up. So I flew to New Mexico and my sister was saying, to visit my sister, say, you know, there's a lot of deaf Indians. And I was like, I didn't know that. And I actually became fascinated with that. And so I kind of forsake my deaf community and became part of my, I found my Indian identity. So I would go to events, all these pop-up events, and I just was fascinated. My brother and sisters really believed in the spirit world and I didn't really believe them. I had heard about it. You know, they had talked about that and the, and the dances and everything like that, but I was really never a part of it. So they said that they saw spirits. I was like, no, I don't believe you. You know, I've never heard, that, you know, they could hear these spirits talking to them, but that never was me. I was like, ah, oh, you're bullshitting me. That's not true. And at this point, I was following my mother a lot and with her cooking and trying to learn all of the things she was wanting to teach me. And I tried to understand her growing up. Um, but she made the effort and my dad didn't, my father didn't. And I, I loved her cooking growing up. So as I was learning my Indian culture, I became just fascinated for the first time in, in Indian culture. And I know that I'm deaf and I have that identity as part of me, but I was just fascinated in learning a lot about it. And I was scared of the spirits that they said that were around, but I never really ex experienced them. And when my brother passed away, he, before he passed away, he taught me how to plant vegetables. So at my house, I said, hey, please teach me how to plant these vegetables and everything. So every year I would do that in his honor. And when my, my, brother passed away I was really really upset and I went to his funeral and my brother was gone and he had a heart attack at I think it was 68 and I was like why did he die he's buried so at that point I had three people with me and they came to these Indian events with me and they came, my, my husband at the time and my other family members, and they would come to these events with me, these deaf Indian events. We'd eat together, we'd sign, and as it got dark, my, the four of us said, okay, it's time to go home. So we got in the car, we started to leave, I saw something and I decided to walk. And I looked up at this old house where I was born and I saw my brother is still there, he's sleeping. And I looked at the barn and I remember playing with my brother, jumping around on the hay and I started to cry and my brother's gone. So I was telling my daughter who was in the house about this and I, as I was walking I was crying and I said I can't believe my brother is gone and I just stopped and I looked at the moon and I saw all these orange <coughs> pumpkins on the ground and I was like wow my brother did all of that work he kept animals he did he gardened he had all these vegetables and I looked down and I was scared. I saw two shadows and it was different. I thought someone was behind me. So I looked behind me, nobody was there, but I see two shadows. So I kept moving, I kept walking and this shadow followed me <coughs> and it actually really scared me. So I kept walking and the shadow followed me and it would stop, I stopped and it would stop too. <coughs> I was like, someone's got to be behind me. Someone's still there. So uh, 
I was walking, I kept walking, and I saw some lights, and then that shadow left and dissipated. And I ran in the house at that point as quick as I could, and I was like, and they said, Mom, what's wrong with you? You look awful, my daughter said. And I said, what's wrong with you? And she says, why are you, who, who was with you? Why are you crying? He says, I think your brother, your, your brother's spirit was walking with you. And I just started to cry. And I said, please come back. And it was really hard. I was so close to my brother. And I said, please come back. And I know he's gone, and he's traveling for 10 days, and he's not up in heaven yet. He's still traveling. He's visiting the people that loved him. And I was crying. And I said, but I saw him walk, and then I saw him leave me. And there was no light, but I was able to see him leave. And I just cried and cried and cried. And at the same time, I said, brother, please come back. And I know you're gone, but I'm very sad and I'm crying. And my other brother and sister said, you're right. Like, I never saw it until my brother was gone, those spirits. And it scared me. Of course, I can't hear it, anything, but I do believe in spirits now. At that point, it's true. Spirits are around me, and I saw it. So, the next day, I went back home, and I was as I was driving this really bothered me about so I got home and I went to see this counselor and I was telling him about what I had experienced you know I think my my brother's spirit was with me I will never forget this and this counselor said you know can I write this down yes go ahead so that was Bob Pollard and I was crying and crying and crying, and still I was so upset. So I was talking. There's a different. There's all these different groups that I visit, but there was. I went to visit Montana, and in Montana, and with this deaf group, and I was explaining about my experience, and they said, "This is your brother. That was your brother following you in his spirit form." And I started to cry. And that's, in Montana, they have very strong spirit um, spirit communities. And so, whether it's New Mexico or Montana, Montana has a lot of strong spirits there. So, the, the Indian culture is amazing there. So, when I went to Montana, I was talking to the chief, and they said, yes, that is your brother. That was your brother, and he cares about you. And I started to cry again. And then my daughter, who, and she was in Albany in college studying to become a lawyer. And my daughter had really bad headaches. And I was like, okay, we're, you, I'm going to go and take care of my daughter. So there was a group of people, and they said, there, is, there are spirits around. Don't be scared. And they could feel, I could feel on my leg that there's like these, this, this feeling on my leg. And I'm like, what is that? It was like a mouse? No. And the deaf people were next, and they were next to me, and they were scared. And then... Sweat was dripping down them, down their, their face. And they're like, how do they know that I'm sweating? And I feel this fan, and it, or I mean, they put this fan on me, and it got better. And then I could feel this, like, pounding on the back area. So, so there, we had this, my brother, and he was doing this, ceremonial thing and then I could feel they said that they couldn't feel the fan am I the only one that was feeling the fan and I was sweating but the other people said no they couldn't feel it and that reduced the amount of sweat that I was I had because I was just like it was just upon me 
So again, like I was saying, in Montana, they have these very strong spirit communities and they do all of these, mm -hmm. these really amazing cultural uh, uh, events. So the Indian culture is so beautiful. There's all sorts of cultures all, all over. But again, I forsake my deaf community and really started to um, get involved with my Indian community, whether it was Iowa or Montana or New Mexico. I stopped going to these now because I'm old. Um, I hang out with a lot of my deaf uh, family and deaf friends and play cards and have fun. Um, so um, I go to Niagara Falls less than I used to. I used to go every month. Now I go maybe once or twice a year because all my brothers and sisters are gone out of 10. I'm the only one left. So I'm the last one and I'm the middle five and my last five and the, the older five are gone. My father passed away at 90 years old and I'm 87. And when, I mean, my father was almost 90 my brother, my sisters and brothers, they were all older too. So, so why my father is famous is oh, uh, my father was never drank a day in his life. Um, my mother's family did. And he decided to join the army as military, but he suffered um, because he was oppressed as an Indian person. So during war, he was put in the front lines because, you know, people. They didn't care what happened. Nothing ever happened to him, but they put people like him in the front and they really picked on him because he was Indian. And when the war was over and it was time to go home, the chief realized, or I mean, sorry, the captain realized he was a very good man and he never drank, he never did anything. And at that point, my father forgave everyone and had. Um, said his peace with, he had made his peace with all of the uh, white captains. So my mother, it was his third wife. And again, the police in Canada put my father in jail for no reason really. My mother was like, what, has, what happened? I'm not really sure why, she says, I'm not really sure why your father is in jail, or I'm not really sure why my husband is in jail, but they took my, or they took my father out of jail. He was very, very sick at that point and almost died. So they tried to kill my father with poison and they had given him something and it really disrupted his stomach. And av after he got out, he was, he got better. And he says, it's because I'm Indian that they're doing this to me. So he flew to Washington to see, they, we were very, very poor, but at that point they paid for him to fly, we paid for him to fly to Washington DC. And we were talking about all the oppression that was happening and especially in Canada, blocking my father from going into the country. So after three hours, he finally got through, and then he was arrested by the police, and he was being oppressed because of his Indian heritage. So when, as a Native American, you're allowed to fish and hunt on your land. But at that point, they said, no, you couldn't do that. You couldn't hunt, you couldn't fish, you couldn't go back to your native lands in Canada and do that. So he wanted to 
protest that, and he went. That's why he went to Washington D.C. And and then there was a parade, and my father was honored for the border crossing. And then every year, the third Saturday of July, the bridge is closed to cars in honor of his border crossing. And my father was the one that was involved in that. So my father was honored because of all of the work he did to get uh, Indians across the border. So one year we start in the United States and we go across to Canada and then other years we go from Canada to the United States. Now I'm very old and I have a cane so I'm not going to be able to do, I don't do that as often and I have not done it uh, every year. So there are still people who do it but I, do, I am not involved and that's why there's a statue of him in Niagara Falls. He was famous for Indian rights and fighting for those Indian rights, and he collected a lot of money, and I'm sorry, people collected a lot of money to uh, create the statue. 1975 is when that's, that happened. So when you see the statue, <coughs> And the closer you are to native lands, it explains why. So I did give a copy to NTID in the library. I think that they have a copy. This woman who wrote it gave me the book and I read it. Again, as I was reading it, I was actually really, it was very upsetting and I cried a lot because of it. I, I really didn't realize what all my father did for the, for the Indian community. And so when I saw my father's statue, I cried. And I said, I'm so proud of my father. And I want him to forgive me for all of the feelings I had felt before. You know, because he was hearing and I was deaf, we had this disparity and this inability to connect, but I love my father and I'm so very proud of him. So, when I visit the cemetery, I cry, or when he passed away and he had his headdress and his, his um, cultural clothing, it was buried, his headdress was buried with him. And his wishes, he told my mother, please have me buried with this. And before he died, he was very sick and he knew that he was close. He gave me a feather. So this is the feather my father gave to me and this was part of his headdress. And he knew that when he died, he wanted to be buried with his headdress, and he wanted to give a feather to each one of his children. And so I cherish this. And I, I've kept it sacred to me ever since his death. Do you have a, somebody asked me, do you have a feather from your father? And my siblings were like, what? We all lost our, our feather, but I kept mine. And some of my siblings couldn't find theirs. They misplaced them. I left mine in my house. And at that time, I really cherished my feather. And when I die, I want to be buried with this feather. It reminds me of my father. And so this is the feather my father gave to me. These are Indian dolls. Uh, corn husk dolls. They have no eyes. Do you guys know why there are no eyes? So in the Indian community, we don't put eyes on our corn husk dolls. And my sister explained to me why. 
So as the corn grows, it dries out, and the leaves are still alive when we pick them. And so if you draw eyes on the dolls, it's believed that they'll come alive. And, you know, if you can hear, you can hear the dolls. Once you draw eyes on them, they come alive, and you can hear them walking. So my sister made these for me. And so when I asked, why are there no eyes, she explained that at night, they can get up and walk around if you draw eyes on them. And so my sister made them for me. And so some people don't know what this means. They just see it and think, oh, it's so beautiful. But have you seen the... So my sister gave this to me. And so when you're sleeping, and if you have a window, and so you're sleeping near the window, good dreams are attracted to this part in the middle, the shiny part. So the good dreams are drawn to the shiny part, and then they'll filter into you as you sleep. And it'll filter out and block out bad dreams. And you want to know how that happens? The bad dreams think, oh, this is so beautiful, and then they get stuck in the webbing of the dream catcher. And so in the morning, and you look at, at the dream catcher, you'll see all the bad dreams have died because they got stuck in the webbing. And so it's purple because purple and white because those match my tribe colors. Purple and white. This is a shell. And this is sage. And so you'll burn the sage and the shell. <coughs> and this is not to be confused with the feather my father gave me. This is a different feather. And as the sage is burning in your house, you'll kind of waft the feather over the burning sage. And it'll get rid of any evil in the house. And it's true. Well, a long time ago, I went camping. I went in a group. And while we were there, we were telling stories about my father. And at the end, we were all in a circle, uh, about to get ready to go home. And one woman got sick. She said she didn't feel good, and I said, well, you'll have to come with me. And so she was shivering. It was a cold month. And she started coughing and saying, oh, I have a headache. So I started burning some sage and wafting the smoke over her body. And right away, instantaneously, the woman started feeling better. She felt fine, her headache was gone. What did you do? She asked me. And I said, you must have had some evil in your body and the sage helped clean it out. And now you feel much better. And it really worked, I'm telling you. And sage smells the one that I was holding up. This is my, and on the right, oh, on the left, you can see my head band, and I'm also in the image on the right. 
And so with the headband, I wore it just to honor my father. I didn't really know what it meant. I just wanted to kind of brag and say, hey, everybody look at me. And then when he passed away and I read the book, I understand everything about the headband. It really honors my father. And regarding the border crossing parade, we did a two mile walk and Judy knows. This is, this, I have these photos of I have many pictures with my father and I'm very proud of those photos. So there's my father. And over here too. My daughter is hearing and she can speak very well. And she's very involved with Indian politics. So you know, if Indian people are jailed, she fights for them. And because she remembers my dad. Talking about all of the work that he did uh, and she's now in Buffalo, and she's a lawyer. Uh, and this was my parents' wedding. And they wore traditional Indian clothing. And so remember, my mother was my father's third wife. The first two wives passed away. And all of their children live with us. Remember, my father had a total of 10 children. And so I gave a presentation at NTID, and they wrote about it in the paper. In the DNC. In the DNC. And some people came and they watched my story and they wrote about it. Uh, and there was a reporter there. And then somebody was like, <laughs> after the presentation, somebody said, it was the clipping of the news article from many, many moons ago. The man who wrote the article retired here. Two years ago, Greg Levadas, who wrote the article, he owns a hot air balloon. And he taught me about it. He asked me if I had ever done it, and I said, No, I'm afraid. You're going to be up in the sky, out in the open. Nope. I am too scared. This is uh, art from my tribe. They sewed it. I sewed it. It's a quilt. I went to college to become, I wanted to go to college to become a math teacher, but I couldn't afford it. But I still wanted to support them. So we go to the state fair. I have a lot of blue in my house. Blue ribbons from winning. I have about seven. <laughs> and I kept giving all of my work to my tribe so they can auction off and collect money. Between six and nine hundred dollars. And a lot of people make baskets, and I can show you some of that later. And I got all of them. 
I call it a funny face. It's made from corn. My son-in-law's daughter's ex-husband made it and gave it to me. And they explained what it meant. So when you blow out, you won't feel it. When you blow out of the mask, you won't feel it. It's pretending to blow in my house. And my sister said that if you have this in your house, So if there's maybe it's like a natural disaster outside, like a hurricane, they can all come to the house. And they can be protected due to this mask. So people who have this mask, their house would be intact if a hurricane were to hit, because it would protect them it would follow a different path and avoid the house. And there would be no damage in the house. And my sister explained this to me that it really happened. So I have two of them. So I went to the, again, Ganandana Festival. And I saw some horses there. And so they, I bought a ticket for a raffle. And if you won, you got a ride. And it was myself and a deaf friend. And they were calling out numbers. And my friend and I were just hoping we'd get called. So, and they called a the number and nobody raised their hand. And all the hearing people just looked around. And somebody pointed to me and saying, told me that I won. So I won this ride, this dog sled ride. And it was really cool. It was during a winter festival and I had such a wonderful time. And here's a photo of me in the newspaper. And I thought, what? I'm in the paper. So there's the festival name. It was so much fun. I would encourage you to go. It's a lot of fun during the winter. There are a lot of Indian games. That was an award from Chief Buck. And it was a beautiful award. It was for all the clothes that I gave. So remember I showed you the picture of the statue of my father? My daughter was somewhere around, but my friend was with me. And uh, many people came up to me and were taking photos of me. <laughs> and I was like, ugh, wow. <laughs> and the reason they were taking so many photos of me is because they found that I was the chief's daughter. And my friend and I were just and shocked. We just stood there getting our photos taken for a few hours. This one, it says on me. So many people in Niagara Falls take photos, and that day was so hot, and I was like, ugh, more photos? And people just kept coming. Most of them were Europeans. Ugh. 
And so I was trying to explain the history of the statue and about my father, and they got bored and they all left. <laughs> Many people say that I like my, like my father, and I agree, I do look like him. We have the same face. The pointing, talking about your, your father. Yeah, so when I, every time I'd be with my father, because we didn't speak or communicate with each other, he would just tap me on the shoulder and point somewhere, and I would look. And it wouldn't be cloudy. Or like 30 hours, it's gonna, in 30 hours it's going to rain. And he was always right. It would rain. Now that my father's gone, you know, I have turned into him. I tap people on the shoulder and I say, hey, it's going to rain soon. So I'm always pointing out the weather to people. And I don't say anything. So like on the farm, we might have to go and pick the vegetables before this happens. The strawberries. But don't laugh. So there are five brothers and sisters. Four of them were younger. And he would have the older, the younger ones would go and pick. And we would complain it's so hot, but my father would still make, make them go. Make me, my brothers, and my sisters go. So we disperse onto the field to go pick up, pick up these strawberries. And I looked around and I noticed that they were all running and they were saying, come on, come on. And I was thinking, what's wrong? Is something happening? Why are they running? And they are just, calling me over, let's get into the house. My brother was like yelling at me. And my brother was yelling, like, come on. And he said, look outside. Big snake. And they saw a big snake in the field. And they screamed, snake, and they all ran. And I'm deaf, so I can't hear them scream. So I just stayed out in the field picking strawberries. And I was wondering, why didn't anyone tap me? And I can see you guys all laughing, but, and it is funny, but at the time it wasn't. So we go back to picking, and then someone's asking, my father's, where's the snake? And my brother's like, oh, it's right there. It's right there. And my father goes to look at the snake, He's like, oh, it's over here? My brother says, yes. So my father grabs a rock, and he, I don't know how he got so skilled, but he threw the rock, and he killed the snake. And he picks it up. And true enough, it was a huge snake. And so I didn't want to go back into the fields after that. But my father would make me. So now, every time I would pick strawberries, I would be paranoid and I'd look to my left and look to my right because I thought a snake was going to come here. And I was the only deaf person there. So they screamed snake and they all ran away and then left me in the field with the snake. And a uh, copy sign. Yeah, I was a student at the Rochester School for the Deaf and I remember finger spelling everything. And so if we were caught uh, signing, we would get our hands hit by the teacher with a ruler. So at my time, we finger spell, but we had to be secret about our signing. And so here's the photo of my time as a basketball player for RSD. I was the captain. This. In like 66, 67? No, 16. 16. She was the captain of the basketball team. At 16. Yeah. So you're saying most of them are gone? Yeah, most of them There's are gone. There's only one left. Oh, just, uh, she's the only one left. 
No. I think three of us are left. Oh, three left. Okay. Yeah, all gone except for three. Do you want to take questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Do you remember this? Were you there? <laughs> uh, what was Matthew's last name? Moore. Moore. So that's the award I was talking about from the chief who recently passed away. I think last year? Yes. Yeah. I think last year. Um, so I got that award about 10 years ago. It was a legacy award. So this is another quilt I sew. And I donated it to the my tribe. It's a tough job sewing something like that. The chief's wife had bought this. And she saw in, in an auction. And then she... Is there a photo of that? Yeah, I used to teach quilting at RSD to children. Yeah, I used to teach quilting. Mustache. Bo uh, Foster. Very sweet. Grandfatherly type. And the next one was Galloway. <laughs> Galloway?